Hello and welcome to In the Making, a series of conversations from North Bennett Street School where we connect with a range of new voices, fields, and perspectives. Before we get into our conversation, we want to thank the many supporters that make our programs possible, including the Massachusetts Cultural Council and our partners in craft. Thanks for joining us, everyone. My name is Kristen Odell. I'm an NBSS staff member and host of In the Making. We are currently sitting in the New Hampshire workshop of chairmaker, teacher, and writer Pete Galbert. We're here. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you for welcoming us into your studio. My pleasure. Um, each year you bring your Windsor Chair Workshop to us in Boston to our cabinet and furniture making program. And each year I personally see, um, I and my colleagues as well, I see a new wave of excitement around learning from you and learning about Greenwood and Windsor Chair making techniques. Um, we all see that it's like a specific energy that comes around when everybody's learning this new thing that they're not learning in the program. So it's, we appreciate it. And we've seen a handful of graduates from North Bennett come to work for you, um, to follow that path of Greenwood chair making and, or something aligned. I say something aligned. I think of Claire Minahan across the hall aligned in tools, making tools that are used in your, your process. Um, and we'll talk about that in this program. And, but that's why we're here is talking about sort of the business owner's perspective on hiring or working with or working, you know, um, collaborating with our graduates from our cabinet and furniture making program. And for our guests, this is part of a, this is the first part of a two part series where we will hear directly from business owners about hiring or working with North Bennett Street School graduates and their insights into their industry. So once again, thank you, Pete, for having us here. My pleasure. And let's just start by, um, tell us your background, how this came to be and how you got to this, this spot. Okay. Um, well, my background education-wise is actually in art, um, painting, sculpture, drawing, things like that. Um, and in the early 90s, I got really interested in pursuing woodworking. And so I uh, sought out sort sort of excuse oh. me that's about to happen <laughs> sort of uh, I sorry that's fine. I sought out in a in a sort of an apprenticeship I went to work for a cabinet maker basically I called everyone in the phone book because that's how you got jobs back then mm -hmm. and Did so phone books still exist I don't even know, I don't know but uh, everyone slammed the phone on me except this one person who talked to me and he's like come down but I'm not going to hire you and I went down and talked my way into a job mm. and so I worked with him in Chicago in the early 90s and. Um, got a little bit of a feel for what cabinet making was, you know, high-end stuff in Chicago. And then I realized that I probably wanted to finish out my school because I was in between college. Um, and I went and I finished college. And then after that, I moved to New York City where that those cabinet making skills served me well. It was in a, kind of a boom time, early internet days. Mm -hmm. And there was money everywhere and everyone was building. Mm. And so it was easy to get work. And so I just kept pursuing it um, through that and through my interest in, in woodworking. Um, so you were building custom cabinets mm -hmm. during like the big tech boom and yeah. all the high prices? Yeah, and, and fixtures. And then I also worked a lot for artists. I built sculptures for people. I just did all sorts of interesting, fun stuff. I worked at museums and galleries. Mm -hmm. and whatever anyone could have me do, I was interested in. Yeah. While also interested in pursuing uh, woodworking in general. Mm -hmm. uh, after a while, I realized that I needed some focus because I didn't want to build up in a cabinet shop. I, I didn't want to be that. Um, long, long term for my career. I was more interested in like woodworking, which yeah. is very separate from cabinet making in some ways. Can you specify that for well, in your own perspective? Yeah, well, woodworking, I mean, I wanted to work, you know, cabinet making, you, you work with a lot of plywood, you're building a lot of boxes, you're doing mm -hmm. a lot of very practical work that's very repetitive and frankly kind of boring at times, um, but it's where the money is. Yep. And, but I realized that I wouldn't be happy with just the money. I needed to pursue something that was more creative, like my arts background had sort of uh, encouraged me to do. Mm -hmm. So I decided um, I had to figure out some way just to make that work for me. So I rented a very small shop, like I had like 10 square feet, you know, like or 10 feet by 10 feet is basically about how big my shop was in Manhattan where I was living. And I was like, what can I make in here? And because I really wanted to learn how to make things with hand tools and with real wood. And I started pursuing making chairs. And that's where I built my first chair. Mm. And after that, uh, I was hooked. I realized, oh, wow, you can actually transform wood from a tree to a chair, which is a saleable product, 
with almost no tools and no space. So you, you that first show that you were building was using green wood mm -hmm. and who what what guidebook were you using? I, everything I could find. I went to the New York Public Library and just everything that was informational about how these chairs were made. I yeah. just researched it. Uh, yeah. Based off of historic, like a historic model, or are we talking Windsor chairs? Yeah, Windsor chairs, yep. because they're very different. Because I looked into making like Chippendale chairs mm -hmm. when I was working in, at different shops, but I just wasn't attracted to the complexity of the joinery, which I didn't think made very much sense for me. It just didn't hook me. Mm -hmm. But when I saw that you could split wood and shave it and jam it into a hole and make a chair, I was pretty much like, that looks like fun. Because it just it's like a magic show. There is something hooking about it, like you just said. Yeah. I hear that from a lot of students at North Bennett and people that are here that just the it's it is like an object that they get just hooked onto. And I think you just specify why. Yeah. And it, it, it when you get into woodworking, I think a lot of it is for the sense of immediacy of the connectedness to making an action and having it play out on the wood in a powerful way. And then you get with machines and you feel like you outsource some of that to a machine. Mm -hmm. like that intimacy is now taken over by the machine, which is, I have no problem with machines. I use them wherever they make sense. But I really quest for that intimacy where I can go in and really impact and make the, the, the wood very malleable. Mm -hmm. And this was the most malleable that the material had ever become in my hands. So not to get too romantic about it, but is there something also about that that you know once a chair is done that your hands have touched every single component of it? Uh, for the buyers, I know that's part of it. For the yeah. people who buy it, and I can say, yeah, I mean, you can see the hand is is all over the piece, and mm -hmm. if it has a sense of immediacy in our sort of very mass-produced iPhone world. Uh, people like to see this that sense of a maker in the fallibility of them, even. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's 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 just a sense of fun. I, I realize that I'm really easily bored. And, and, you know, I, it, it's not <laughs> it's a good thing to identify for yourself. Yeah. It's not enough just to be like, well, this is a, a good thing to have to do. I'm like, no, it has to thrill me. Yeah. I have to be engaged. I have to be able to fail at any moment. And, and it really keeps that right on the cusp of success or failure. What is something that thrills you about this? If you can bring it down to one, one part of it or one. Oh, it, it's all throughout it. You know, any of the things that I show people process wise that I do, you know, I have a couple children, um, who, who, I, who I play with a lot and we we hang out in here and it's just showing them what it is to bend a piece of wood into a curly cue mm -hmm. I see it through their eyes and that's how I still feel about it mm -hmm. you know it's just like check this out you can do this yeah. you know and I put them on the lathe and they're just sitting there shooting shavings everywhere and they're just excited and so am I yeah it just comes down to that versus the idea of designing a piece of furniture that you know will be exciting to a client because of the achievement of it and the beauty of it is one thing but if it's torture to get there I knew I couldn't live my life that way. You know, I couldn't spend every day torturing myself to make something that someone would find worthy. Right. I'd rather just have the excitement of doing it and hope that it shows through in the end and becomes saleable. And those things fell into place. Mm -hmm. Do you feel um, there's, uh, this might be a confusing question, but, um, and no offense to every other style of chair out there, <laughs> yeah. but are there other, uh, can you give an example of the opposite of that where making a piece and what style was that piece that did not spark joy? Like those, like, oh my God, I'm making this right now. Oh, like I don't, I, I, that's the easiest question in the world. Ask any woodworker you've ever met, like, was that piece fun? And, mm. and, and, and there invariably everyone will have a piece where like, no, that was not fun. What is that for you? Um, that has to do with a lot of flat work with a lot of small pieces. I also realize I'm, as a maker, someone who loves to take a piece of wood and reduce it. Even though later I put it with other wood to add up to a chair, my whole experience and connection is through the reduction, through mm -hmm. the carving, the shaving, and the shaping, and the bending. Mm -hmm. Some people, and I've known people like this, are like, no, I want a million little pieces, all cut the same on the, on the saw, and then I want to add them up to something amazing. And that's a very different, that's an additive way of working versus mm -hmm. a, a subtractive. Mm -hmm. And I'm much more subtractive, more sculptural. About right. Um, we're going to get into some connection points between um, you as a business owner and an employer mm -hmm. yeah. and um, graduates from North Bennett Street School. Before we do that, I'm for our, our guests here, um, there is a graduate sitting on the other side of this camera. And I'm going to ask him, Colin Schmidt, the same question. What is a piece that drove you nuts that you would say no you can just speak um <laughs> sorry to push you on the spot no, 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 it's we're right. going free here um a piece that first drove me nuts was uh my first Windsor chair ah 
Well, there you have it. See, um, <laughs> and the reason is because it is a much different way of working a material that I, at the time, felt pretty comfortable with and felt that I understood in a lot of ways. But it turns out the technologies and the techniques used were so different, it garnered this frustration and these new learning curves that I wasn't prepared for. But as soon as you do start to grasp them and understand them, it informs the rest of your work so much more, working mm -hmm. with dry materials, so on and so forth, that the whole experience becomes so much more valuable, working both green and dry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Yeah, and course. we'll see Colin in a little bit too. Yeah. He'll pop his head around. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot, but hey, we're here. It is a very different way. I always uh, liken it to like, you could take a uh, someone who's an expert at making wedding cakes. It makes the most elaborate, beautiful wedding cakes in the world and say, today we're doing barbecue. And that's the difference between like making a uh, flat work, you know, and mm -hmm. doing chairs. Right, right, you know? right. And then it, you add another element when you go to the Greenwood. So it's just so different that I get woodworkers all the time. They're like, I've got 40 years experience, but they they really don't know the first thing about working with the mm -hmm. Greenwood. So it really changes a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so a direct question about um, drawing that line between mm -hmm. you as a business owner and North Bend Street graduates. Um, is there a common thread that you have seen um, in graduates of, of our cabinet furniture making program that's a quality that is like, as an employer is, yes, you got it. A lot of what I'm looking for has very little to do with what they can do, but how they learn to do something. And I think that's what the school is kind of all about, which is like teaching you to learn, hopefully. Mm. So it's that capacity to engage a new process, take it on and do it well. That is like, that's the arc of everything you're going to ever have to do in your life and making. And so that's what I want to be observant of, you know, is that ability to be in that moment of failure and still keep going. And then also take it as an opportunity and not just a soul crushing moment, mm -hmm. you know, but also to, to, to thrive in that. If you can thrive while learning, and I think that's what the school um, has to offer, which is you're going to get such a crash course that hopefully it you don't think of it as like, now I know everything more as like, now I know how to start learning. Because when people get to me, I still have to show them what I expect and what they they need to know because they don't. You know, it's kind of like, I think lawyers often say this, you go to law school to, to, to learn about the law, but you have to work with a lawyer to become a lawyer. Mm -hmm. You know, you actually go out of there and you know nothing about practicing law. Oh, absolutely. And, and it's the same thing yeah. here. It's like, I know that they come with a deep foundational awareness, but that's so different than the skill mm -hmm. of practicing it. But just getting that foundational awareness is key. Otherwise you have to start you know, from scratch, explaining every little thing to somebody who may not know those things. So I guess it's that foundation that I, I think is most valuable mm -hmm. as well as for me, an opportunity to see how they handle that. Yeah. You know, so when I- Handle when I, you learning your methods and- Or just, just the school's methods. I just, what, what uh, I see Dan Fay has set up with the program. I see how they come through it. I get to watch their progression. I was saying before we started, I see them three times when, uh, when they first get there, when I work with them a year later, and then when they leave. Yeah. And watching that arc of achievement, it tells me a lot about them. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's been hugely uh, fun and valuable to be able to go, oh, because not everybody who I end up working with or really enjoying collaborating with um, is fantastic in the beginning. Yeah. Often they're the worst. Yeah. And then I watch the arc of how they change. And it's that ability to grow, change and learn that says to me, okay, that's somebody I can invest in and who I can get value from. Mm -hmm. Same way. That's such a great and precious perspective that you have to see them in those three stages. Yeah, it's really helpful. Yeah. Um, I have not not similar, but, but parallel um, experience with students from my vantage point as the, so the putting their tools together. So I see them on the first day, mm -hmm. you know, getting their first tools, getting ready to go to the first day of class. Right. And then sort of on down the process and to see the growth is it's really, really something. Yeah, it is. Um, a, a question that I have full permission to ask from our provost, Claire, um, can you identify any bad habits that have come out of our furniture making students? Um, I, I would say it comes down to expectations. Mm. You know, it's it's such an intensive that 
I think it can be very confusing to them when they hit the reality of the work. So the reality of post how this, school, post, post school. school. Yeah. Yeah. Like what it really looks like a day in the life of working through the shop, a day in the life of the problem solving of on occasion, the monotony uh, on occasion, the loneliness, because that's the school is so social and mm -hmm. there's so much interweaving of people's experiences that when you get out of that, it's just you and the work often. And you have to motivate yourself, keep yourself company and mm -hmm. also solve all your own problems. Yep. And that is a challenge. And finances, taxes, everything, yada, yada, everything. Yada, yada. Yeah, it's yeah. it is just a steep drop off that I always encourage people to look at their first year as a complete wash out of the school, you know, because you went through such an extreme curve, your life will not continue on that trajectory. Mm -hmm. It will change, um, and it will slow down, and you will all of a sudden stumble probably from that experience, that feeling of wow, everything just went from zero to 80 so fast. Mm -hmm. And you're like, I know, but now we have to slow you back down to 20. You know, get your feet on the ground, practice your skills, get yourself to a point where you can relate them to uh, an employer or the buying public in a way that is much different than what you experienced in the school. Some of the people I think have done really well at the school that I've seen came in already with like that experience of trying to like uh, interact with the public and interact with finished work. And then they go to the school and then they come out of it like a rocket ship, right? depending, you know, and so it goes different ways. It, it's what you're prepared for. You know, I think we've all seen uh, my friend Aspen come to the school and just shoot right off into the, the yep. you know, and that had to do because of 15 years of previous work she'd done. Mm -hmm. You know, she'd been an artist and she'd been thinking about making work and interfacing with the public for a long time. Yeah. So I think those are things you can't subtract from the equation and expect or, or and not count into what's going to happen to you. You know, you don't just come out of there, you know, and jump right into it in a way that you might expect. So I think that's something you can't really let tell people they have to experience mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because it's supposed to be a lifetime pursuit. The minute I know what I'm doing forever for the rest of my life, I'm quitting. You know, <laughs> the point of this is because it's fun and it's fun because I'm learning. Right. You know, ask Colin or anybody who I'm working with. Um, they'll tell you that it's all about what can we do next? What don't we know mm -hmm, is interesting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a hard way to make a living, though. Yeah. So I think it's it's a little bit of a you know catch twenty two, and you got to be prepared for the ups and downs of it. Right. The so this is an interesting conversation constantly within, um, especially cabinet and furniture making, is what you know setting setting yourself up for success beyond graduation. And my question is um, about how much do you attribute your and that's for you to say if it's a success or not, you know, what you're doing here. Um, how much of your business is attributed to um, your just like fearless drive because you, you know you're doing this, you're going to make it happen and just straight up hard work mm -hmm. um, as opposed to, you know, I mean, what what's their special sauce is what I'm getting. Oh, at. God. Yeah. A uh, fear, <laughs> fear of starving. No, that's a good one. Yeah, that, that's well, it, it is motivating. It is. I, I look at it as like you, it, the strange soup of things, you know, that comes together is made of so many different little ingredients. And I, there were times I was like, well, I just wasted five years on this or this part of my life on that. And all those things have at some point or another come back to help me or restrict me. You know, it, it depends. I mean, any education you have is either going to, you know, like teachers, a teacher will show you all sorts of great stuff they'll also teach you their limits and you've got to be careful about that and and i've done that to myself many times over in different ways yeah you know, I've, I've brought myself forward and held myself back through through hard work and ignorance equal measure sometimes and so you feel like you're going nowhere but then often somehow the ignorance will drop away or the, the resistance to whatever you need to do will and then you can make strides mm -hmm. you know maybe you know your assumptions about what you know uh, are holding you back and you give up those assumptions and then you just learn a few things yeah and you, you go great yeah i mean that that takes us back to your referencing um a person's capacity to learn yeah huge part of that equation which then ties us to um the secret sauce which from what i'm actually getting from you is just like steeping yourself in reality you know what is the reality of a career beyond graduation like you have to face those things yeah. right yeah, and it's it's not for the faint of heart in a lot of ways. That the good news is at some point I found I've done enough of it now that I relish the uncertain. 
-hmm. like and and my friends like Kelly Harris from the school who I worked with on this tenon cutter we were working on it for a week or so together and I was so excited when we got to a delicious problem I was like oh we have no idea what we're doing this is great <laughs> this is wonderful I know we'll get this we'll get there but in the early days of my career when I hit those points with my chairs or the tools I was making or anything I was ashamed I was embarrassed I was confused I was terrified I was like I don't know I don't know there's no, I don't know it uh, but now I'm like oh we'll figure it out Mm. but that took a long time I think the sooner that you can get to the point where you have some sense of like yeah it'll work I'll make it work mm -hmm. then then that pays off it yeah. yeah I also love that idea of um the excitement of running to a problem because it's we we have the answers in our phones to everything yeah. so enjoying that process of solving something like that is yeah. really cool well and in woodworking especially if you're designing your own stuff you're making your own problems all day long mm. You know, that's yeah. the whole thing. And I see a lot of that at the school where the students are like, I want to build this piece. And the whole point is like, I don't know how. And then the teachers kind of nudge and guide them along while they try and figure it out. And it's that learning what you don't know. Mm -hmm. So it's not just like this sort of rote building of skills until now you can make a box. Right. You know, it's just like, yeah, there's a lot going on here. Yeah. How do we attack it? Um, from your experience working with our graduates, um, mm -hmm. What what is something that we're missing in our curriculum? Again, another approved question. Yeah. Um, what would you add? Here's the problem. If you put me in charge of that curriculum, I would do so much of a worse job than Dan does. Just DFA is. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and that's why that's one of the biggest reasons I, I work with the folks there and do it because what I've seen him do is to really try and structure it to give people the opportunity to rise to the level of the mm -hmm. and to give them everything possible. That's what he's been doing, and that's why I get so enthused by working right. with the folks from there. So it's, I don't know. I don't know how to do that. I don't know. Um, well, let me give you yeah. a, a sort of a path to follow down. Okay. There've been many graduates who have said, um, and you know, the, the curriculum Dan's job is amazing. Mm -hmm. What what I've heard in the past, many of us have heard in the past, is an additive, like an additional year or semester of a specific learning, like um, restoration. So mm -hmm. along those lines, in in the scope of what they're learning in their projects, what's something that you could see as being added, an additive that would enhance that? Yeah, I don't know, except to continue to interface the people with the buying public, mm. because that's the first thing you're gonna face the second you get out of there. Mm -hmm. So maybe more interaction of craft shows and, and not just like a juried exhibition, but like a real like, hey, I made this widget, do you wanna buy it? So you can see, cause there's, there's a magic moment when the money in somebody's wallet is worth less to them than the thing you made. And until you hit that moment, they'll keep their money and you'll keep your thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's a, I remember seeing that when I was selling the chairs and I was like, holy cow, I get it. They don't care about that money as much as they care about this thing. Right. And it's silly to say that, but that exchange became very viscerally, you know, oh, you know rise, rose my awareness. And I still struggle with it because then in time, as you get better at this and your stuff gets maybe sought after, your prices go up. And then you have to be like, okay, now I can't relate to the amount of money that's, you know, it can be, mm -hmm. it's always daunting. Mm -hmm. Those experiences though, the seed of that is important because at some point you might want to say, I've put so much into this, but the value isn't there if they don't connect to it the way you do. Yes. Your additive does not make mean it's present for them. Right. No, I love that. And I, I um, facilitate trade shows um, we just did fine furnishings, and that is a gap in interaction, not only to have that beautiful moment, but also to have the inverse of that moment where, again, steeping yourself in the reality of what you just made, um, you know, how well, like, how can you further this with your, in, in your career? Like, how can you take this beautiful thing you just killed yourself over for two years? Yeah. And it, so that the inverse of that moment, you know, the steeping yourself in reality. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's important and it's also invigorating. I remember when I first started showing my chairs and no one bought any of them, but everyone coveted them. And that was what I needed what to see. What did that mean? Yeah, I, I, well, it meant someone out there is going to buy these chairs. At some point that exchange will happen. I was like, look how excited everyone is about this work. I didn't know if they'd just be like, yeah, whatever, a bunch of chairs and keep walking. Mm -hmm. They didn't because I was showing them how I made them and doing that kind of stuff. It was very low rent. You know, I was next to the guy with the Budweiser Whirly gigs and like, <laughs> but I had a crowd around me and I was like, why are they so excited? I didn't know. And I fed off that. I was like, I get it. They're interested. Now I just need to like widen my scope. I don't need to sell a chair to everyone. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. I, I couldn't keep up with that. Right. You know, I needed to sell this many chairs back then. It was like, you know, 30 a year, 40 a year. And to, to get me started. And that's how I would go about it. And so that's an interesting point to land on um, for students who are listening or graduates, um, that that's a transformative moment right there where you're taking in this knowledge from the room. Nobody's buying your goods but in that moment, but they're coveting them. So that's your moment to do the math right there yeah. and, and sort of plan, do like a quick rough mental sketch of your future plan for your product. Right. That's a learning moment right there, as opposed to maybe thinking, um, why are and they buying it you know yeah what's the problem here yeah. I'm gonna go talk to them about that. I was just happy they cared no but that's a yeah. big deal yeah. like you you did planning in that moment yeah and well you know it's interesting to to draw that to another moment maybe two years later they started buying slowly but surely they bought enough that I was like holy cow I can't believe I'm making chairs and making money doing it not much money probably losing in the big picture but a couple of years later I came out with like a settee a bench and it was priced accordingly more expensive than the chairs and people just lost it over that. They just thought it was gorgeous. Nobody bought the settee, but they bought so many more chairs mm. because they understood that that wow experience that that bench gave them had the same DNA as these smaller, more affordable mm-hmm. chairs. Mm-hmm. And then uh, from that moment forward, the rest of my career, I had a chair over. So. Yeah, that's amazing. It was, and it, I didn't understand that, but it's the same reason that you know Chanel puts out a four hundred thousand dollar dress that two people buy yes. and they sell so much like small bottles of perfume. Yes. yes. <laughs> because everyone loves that connection. Absolutely. And I didn't realize that. So there's a whole lifetime of learning about, you know, what it is people want and want to do. And hopefully you can connect it with what you want to do. That's, mm-hmm. that is the whole game. It is, yeah. is for us to, you know, um, enjoy, you know, love work, you know, have that connectivity of loving your work. Yeah. 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 It's a tall order, but once you get there, it's, it's yeah, you don't want cool. to let go. It's, yeah, it's 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 hard it to seems, go back. Yeah, well, you know, you pay some prices, but I gotta say it's it's okay. Yeah. Um, when a person comes to work in your shop, um, whether from Garth Bennett or or anyone like Colin here or um, you know, Kelly Aspen, mm-hmm. what is the first thing that you ask of them or what's the first thing that you demonstrate for them? Um, that's a good question. I don't even know. It'd probably be better to ask like Colin that. Um yeah, do you, do you have any? Do you remember the first thing that? Uh, uh, first thing that we did, prepping for class. Yeah. Uh, writing parts, rough turning, uh, understanding how to break down stock. Uh, a lot of the, the basic things to get me up and running uh, that don't necessarily in that moment require the nuance and the, the further explanation and the further detailing. Something that uh, base understanding, which I had, gets me up and running, gets me moving. And then as we move on down the line, we take the moments in those steps and we dive deeper into them and we explore why we're doing it, the way we're doing it. What are the important aspects? What things do we not have to focus on as much? Mm-hmm. So the small things first. Yeah, well, so they'd never come into my shop and like make finished chairs. Right. But what they can start to do is rough out the turnings that I will do finished turnings on. But if they can align the fibers and get it correctly sized and do those first steps, that's like forever. They know that. And then soon they will work towards doing those turnings themselves. So like Charlie Ryland, who's another graduate, um, certain classes um, with certain style of turnings. I just say, Charlie, I need those turnings. And he could knock out the whole set beautifully, Mm -hmm. you know, but initially he was just rough turning them for me. And so it's like bring yourself through to the point that pretty soon it's just second nature to do these things. It's it's a little bit of the karate kid type thing, you know, where you just you just keep at these motions and these these things, and soon you'll see stuff. But I think one of the nice things about teaching with me and teaching is just the greatest teacher ever, because when you teach, you see mistakes you would never make. You have to see nuance and deeper into everything mm-hmm. because you're dealing with all you know the hardest material to work, which is people. <laughs> and, uh, so and, and they will shock and amaze you at the things they can do. And, and then you learn even more about what it is a good process because there's a problem that comes after you get skilled to a certain level is you can't imagine what it is not to be that skilled. So you can get highly skilled and become a terrible teacher because you don't know what people don't know anymore. And it's always reconnecting to that moment where they're just blindly facing this material going what do I do mm-hmm. and that's why teaching is really it keeps you pretty fresh yeah yeah 
Um, so that kind of what we were just talking about kind of speaks to my next question. What do you, what's more important for you in your business um, with hiring an employee, their skills or chemistry between, you know, in the shop, shop chemistry? I, I have to have both. Yeah. Yeah. You can't, you can't have one or not the other. Yeah. You have to be able to speak to each other and get along and connect on the work and be some pop going, all that stuff. Um, but then they also have to be able to just do the work. Right, because yeah. obviously it's a wood shop. There are tools and sharp, sharp things yeah. and machines. Like you have to be confident. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's it takes, the nice thing is, is having taught so much, I hopefully built up some sense of like what people are capable of. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm not looking for, really, I'm not looking for complete skills. I want potential because often complete skills come with complete bad habits. Mm. Yeah, embedded bad habits yep. that are really hard to break. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm just going to pause and remind our pan our guests that you feel free to ask us questions throughout and I'll just, I'll watch, I'll monitor the chat and ask Pete those questions. Um, this might be a tough one and you can speak to your business in general or your business specifically or indus the industry in general, Windsor chair industry or yeah. chair or furniture industry, pay expectations for graduates or young, you know, fresh out of school woodworkers. And I don't need a number, but let's no, just no, no, I, I'm just thinking, um, I guess that it's always better to over promise or under promise and over deliver. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. That's the way. Yeah. Because, okay, here's the thing. I, I wouldn't recommend somebody come right out of the school and say, let me run your wood shop. I'd recommend them say, I mean, not let me sweep it, but let me do some basic work while I observe what goes on here. Let me spend some time quietly learning without the pressure of you're supposed to know this because it's a kind of, most of what I ever worked with, it's a bit of a cruel environment. If you come in claiming to be able to do a lot mm. because it doesn't just mean you can do it. It means, can you do it fast? Can you do it repeatedly? Can you do it at a high level constantly? Do you have quality control? You know, And can you do that without struggle? Because if you're struggling, you're going to burn out. You know, you've got, there's certain things you got to be like, no, I can do this. I can do this like I can drive a car. We can all drive a car, but do you remember learning to drive a car? It was harrowing. And the first time you were driving on your own, I, I think about this the other day, like this first year, like you'd get on a road that was faster than the one you'd be comfortable with. And you yeah. knew it. And I would say, slow down. Nothing's going anywhere. You've gotten so much ahead of the ball. Like I, I look at the students at the school and I'm like, okay, I wish I had done it when I was younger only because it would have saved me probably 10 years of on the job, start, stop learning difficulties, you know, trauma, getting berated, you know, screwing things up, failing, you know, all these kind of things just to get that very basic foundation to come out. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean you should expect it to be everything you're going to need, mm -hmm. you know, and I would be more of a learner. This is, um, and I've described this to people before with like Aspen, who we can all agree is doing really well. Her superhero power is keeping her ego out of her learning. She's like, I don't know. Show me. Yeah. I'm like, do you know how to do this? She's like, nope. And I'm like, okay, great. Let's start there. Mm -hmm. And then she very quickly picks it up. Yeah. I'd much rather have that than her go, yeah, I think so. And then try and tell me why the way she was doing it that didn't work was supposed to be right. You know, she is an ultimate sponge in that way. And then yeah. she spins it back out in the most exquisite way. Yeah. And it's, it's something to, I think if you want to emulate something, emulate that. Yeah. Emulate being the lifelong learner yeah. who's not afraid to say, I don't know, mm -hmm. show me. Mm -hmm. And, and if you can do that, you know, if the person telling you after you've said, I don't know, show me, um, then you should go, you know, if they're cruel to you or not responsive to that, then they don't know what potential is and you should go someplace. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to be like, no, nope. but also hopefully you haven't overpromised. You haven't said, I know everything and I can complete this work in this amount of time and I can do right. it so well. Right. Just let yourself be where you are. And I think the school is a bit of a fisheye lens to that because you do come out having seen so much. Your, your brain is so full of knowledge, but it's going to take years for your hands and your skill to catch up is the way I kind of look at it. Uh, can you explain that for like, dig deeper into that, the school is a fisheye lens? Because I'm still stuck on, and I don't know if you're connecting the two, but um, I, I still go back to the expectations for a graduate coming out. And this mm -hmm. takes me back to a trade show, for example, where yeah. 
you have your furniture out, why aren't people buying it? Why aren't people interested? The just expectations. And is that part of what you're referring to? Yeah, well, in the school, you're seeing everybody around you aware of what you're doing, what you're trying to do, super appreciative of it. Those like, okay, so when I used to try and sell chairs, I noticed immediately that I needed one piece of equipment there to sell chairs. And it was my shave horse where I actually make the work, the mm -hmm. spindles and whatnot. If I didn't sit there shading spindles, people just walked right by. Yeah. But when they saw me doing that, they were like, their brains broke. They're like, what are you doing? And I'd be in the middle of a 10 chairs. I'm a shave horse. And I say, well, I'm making these chairs. And they just, they look at me like a dog listening to the radio. They'd be like, what? And you, and then they'd get involved. They would learn something. And basically through that process of talking and showing, I would change out their vision of what a chair was. And that's the hook. Mm -hmm. That explanation but it's not just because I thought it was a cool way to make a chair. I'd be like, no, this is actually a way that I can make a chair very fast. That's going to last. That's going to be comfortable. It's going to be durable. It's going to be beautiful, you know, with very simple tooling. So I can afford to sell it to you for this because I don't have the overhead. Like, and then they go, yeah, I see it. And then they covet it and they may not value it then, but next year they came back and bought. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's more about that connecting other people to it. Where at the school, everyone's deeply connected. Yeah. You know, there's a vibe going through the whole place, which is great because you can like out of the corner of your eye. That's what I mean by the fish eye. Like you see them woodworking and them woodworking and everybody's woodworking and you're just learning so much from it. You get out into the world and it's like that meme. that's like, you know, no one cares. See, no one cares. Yeah. You, no have, cares. you, you have to connect them to it. Yeah. Why should you be like, but I, I did it by hand. Mm -hmm. Who cares? Who cares if you did it by hand? Mm -hmm. Show me the end result that, that hooks me in and connects to me. So they didn't care that I did it by hand until I showed them that I could actually do it faster that way. And then they're like, holy cow. And then they felt really deeply connected. Yeah. So just engaging with people. Yeah. And on the outside them. of the world, like yeah. outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you speaking to um, Fish Island, like that's that culture of being um, in the program in North Bennett Street School's uh -huh. cabinet furniture making program where you constantly have support. You always have peers and instructors to lean on. It's kind of just like a microcosm for an example for any industry or any realm. The second you leave, you you know set your expectations. But the good news that I think is great and I've seen is that community carries on. And you also are into a community of alumni as well. Mm -hmm. And that's something I never had. So I would work at a shop and you you had whoever showed up that day and whoever's life experience had brought them to one place or another with their limits and it was often not very pleasant because everyone was playing out um you know basically what is a blue collar scene you know some people were just there because they could just sand panels all day and didn't care right some people were trying you know what i mean everybody had but with that group you have this commitment to the craft and this interest and that links you up with all the people who've been there and i i I now, because I teach there, I've got that link as well. Mm -hmm. So I got to sort of catch up and get a part of that too. Yeah. And that's what we were talking about. Also, so you mentioned this earlier that you were in, um, you were in Boston before and you were, it was just like a lonely existence, you know, just lonely, just you and your shop. And that's one of the beautiful things about the craft world and this, this universe is that there's such a connectivity. It's all generative for all of you. And so then you moved into the shop where you're surrounded by other people that are like, oh, wait, how'd you put it? Like, oh yeah, I exist. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. There'd be days you just be like, who cares? I just, I just put this chair together. Who cares? No one cares. <laughs> no one cares. <laughs> yeah. It's, it can be that way. It's nice just to be among, amongst peers mm -hmm. for sure. So I think finding yourself some sort of a shop where you've got connections that way is really helpful. Yeah. And staying connected, you know, keeping that thread of connectivity is clutch from what I've seen from woodworkers who have graduated North Bennett and evident in your business here is staying connected. Yeah. 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 It's a big part of it. Um, what was the toughest thing that you've had to learn in your career? Um, gosh, that's a good question. I think I'm still trying. That's the problem. Um, that something really hard. Give well, us some, make us cry. Yeah, right. <laughs> that, here's here's the thing, and I, you can anyone can do it, but do you want to? Like you can make a living making, you know, turning a thousand of something every day. You can make a living making popsicle sticks. Basically, that's a wood product. It needs to be cut. There's so many things you can do if you're willing that you can do that. 
Okay, so that's the, the hard thing is like, what do you want to do? And what's it going to be that makes that so much harder? You know, because if you're willing to make boxes all day, you, you know, I, I always joke that in here we make shavings, but across the hall, they make money, <laughs> you know, because they do, they make such beautiful high-end cabinetry yeah. and oh my gosh, they make, that's where money is. and they make such good money and it's yeah. so wonderful. And I love that they do it and they do it to such a high level. I admire their work. Um, I don't want to do it. And, and recognizing that and being like, oh no, what am I in for? You're effectively asking to be some form of an artist, mm-hmm. you know, some form of somebody whose creativity and connected to this connectedness to the work matters right you know nobody buys the cabinets because the the, the maker is so deeply connected right. to that specific kitchen cabinet where they keep their colander <laughs> yep. they just want a really nicely made box and they'll pay for it so doing this other thing where you have to imagine your own value transform it and, and get it to someone else so it's not about getting your ship to float it's about steering it because mm-hmm. you can make popsicle sticks you can make widgets of all sorts and wooden stuff you know you see it all the time where people are making stuff and if you can do it fast enough and cheap enough you can make a living. What is a widget? What, what's that? What is a widget? You keep saying. Oh, I'm sorry. That, and you're not. This, you're, I've heard that before. A widget is any physical object. Okay, got it. Yeah, you, got you it. can make anything. You can. I mean, you can make cutting boards. Yeah. You can make anything you want. But I've seen so many people struggle with like, oh, I see. I got my ship to float, and I hate my freaking ship. The mm-hmm. problem is, it's go. It's not going a direction I like. So it's really steering it. And when I get together with people who've been doing this for a long time and who you, most people would consider very successful, we always, all of us have the same conversation. Like, how are you steering your ship? Like, what are you doing now to give yourself more of that connectedness, more freedom, more joy in your work? Um, because if, if, if you want it, if you want it, no, it's okay, George. It's okay, it's all right. Because if you want to just make money, you should, you know, carpet cleaning is there's like so much money yeah. in carpet cleaning. <laughs> Why? Collecting. Yeah, there's so much good tiling, jobs out there. Tiling. tiling. Oh my gosh. Yeah. If I get paid like a tiler. <laughs> so it really comes down to like, how do you steer your ship so that the sacrifices you're making and the joys you have yeah. are, are being realized? So then I'm going to put you on the spot. How are you steering your ship? Um, I'm asking for help. What's your compass book? What is I'm asking? Okay, so you we're talking about North Ministry <laughs> students I'm working with. Uh, Karen Cascone, who's another uh, yeah. wonderful graduate of there, is going to come and she and I are going to be focusing on steering my ship. She's going to help me with some organizational things, mm. some market things, things that I've realized after 25 years I'm crap at. Market is in trade shows? No, just oh, well, more like the market, the furniture market. Just how can I spend more of the time doing what my value is? So, for instance, these days, as a self proprietor, um, I end up spending too much time emailing, too much time computer working, not enough time creating the value. People don't come to take classes with me because I'm, you know, can make a hell of a spreadsheet. <laughs> they just don't. But I'm making more spreadsheets than chairs some days. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, how do I get out of this? How do I, because I'm using my highest value in my lowest value. Mm-hmm. So I need help. So I'm getting help. Yeah. I'm going to get someone who's uh, schooled in an organization mm-hmm. and can maybe look at it and go, okay, here's where you're spending your time. You should do this. You should hire that out. The value that you're now paying someone, you, you know, half what you have to pay yourself is more important. Mm-hmm. So I think ask for help, mm-hmm. study up. I, I've had some very successful people who I know in like Boston um, creative circles and they're constantly interacting with people who can help them that way yeah getting mentorship getting getting guidance i mean mentorship huge um but i mean the the rate of failure in small business is beyond yeah. especially in handmade goods art you know the art realm um so being conscious of that and being aware of that sure you know if you're if you suck at spreadsheets, you probably should have someone that's doing it. That's for right. You. That's right. If you want to be beyond that rate of failure of small, you know, the, that's right. If you want to beat that success. Yeah, yeah, and and it's I think it also comes down to like in woodwork, there's a there's a trap you can fall into, which is well, if if I'm doing this kind of work, if I'm making boxes, you should have the best saw you can have, because it will make your life easier. I've watched my neighbor who makes beautiful boxes. He's Improved his saw three times since I've known him in like seven years. You know, he had one that was okay. Then he had one that was good. Now he's got the one that's awesome. Mm-hmm. It's really easy to jump to the awesome before you need it, you know, and go, well, but if we're making boxes, awesome would do it. So you you tool up ahead of either your interest or your market. Mm. You know, you're like, we are set to do this thing and there's nobody buying. Mm-hmm. Or our overhead is way up here and our, 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 our fluctuating market is all over here. 
but we've locked our, in our overhead. Those are all things that when I made chairs, I was like, okay, I don't owe anybody money for my tools. Right. I can, yeah. I was making them literally in the back room of my house. Yeah. And that all meant a lot to me being able to be more playful and open where if I had been paying, you know, like now I have overhead mm -hmm. and it, it can mm -hmm. be a little crushing. Another reason I want some help because right. to have a shop as big as I've got now and to have help, I've got to think ahead, you know, mm -hmm. really in advance, I got to do a lot of planning. It's if I had had that initially, it would have been very much crushing for someone of such low skill at that. Right. Well, I mean, be, being smarter on your tools, though, I love that you brought that up because I, I have a, a weird analogy, but it makes so much sense. But this, the idea that you, sorry for the light, Pete. Mm. <laughs> sorry. I can just move. Oh, there we go. There we go. Um, the, um, you know, being, using what you have and believing in your own, like trusting in your skills and your aesthetic and leaning on that to create a niche for yourself using the tools that you have, as opposed to, I'm going to go set up this beautiful shop and before yeah. I have a product yeah. and a simplified analogy that I just have to get this in is, um, uh, you, you know, you don't need the best tennis racket to, you don't need a brand new tennis racket to get on the court and play tennis. You can just use the one in your garage. that has been there for 15 years. Yeah. So yeah. Absolutely. You, know, you don't need those to like be reasonable. Yeah. I carved my first seat with like a bent piece of metal. There you, you go. You know, I just ground it and sharpened it. And I was like, okay, I don't have, you know, and I started making my own tools because I couldn't find them. They didn't really exist, the specialty tools I wanted. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, I tried to keep my overhead really low. And that's I still struggle with that a little bit. And we're still pretty lean and mean here. Yeah. You know, actually the other day I did something I'd never done before, which is I looked up, I was like, what's a good business profit? How much should I be? If I look at my gross and they, that? yeah, that's funny. And there's all this information like, well, here's a good business profit. And I was shocked. Like, I was like, we're killing it. Like, and that doesn't mean we're making so much money. It, it means that the ratio between what we take in and what we spend mm -hmm. is really good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I didn't ever look at that that way. And I'm sure a, a mentor would have been like, what's your business ratio? And I'd be like, oh, well, that's obvious. Yeah. You know, and he would have been, and I, or the, she would have told me, like, that's bad. Right. You know, you're spending too much money or you're doing great. You know, we, yeah, we were somewhere around 30% or something like restaurants, were like three, 4%, you know, I was like, holy cow. Well, I mean, especially you can, in the first years. I bet you can trace that back to you using a scraped piece of metal for you, yeah. some of your first products. It's just, you, yeah. you, you relied on what you knew you could put out there aesthetically design wise, like you, you leaned and trusted yourself. Yeah. Is that, is that fair to say? It is, but I, I, I think it'd be, um, it would be a disservice to not mention the like many years I spent making very little money. Mm -hmm. You know, it was not like, uh, it, it took me a long time yeah. to get to the point where I was like, oh, the ratio of my effort to my income is really nice now, mm -hmm. you know, but you know, I'm in my fifties now also, you know, but all through my thirties, it was a pretty rough ride of like, this is a lot of work and not a huge turnaround, but I also wasn't going into debt because of it. Like it, um, I ne I've never owed money on my tools, that kind of thing. Yeah, but and that it, was probably your threshold of, of that that level of I'm doing what I love, you yeah. know, like that balance. I'm not making a ton of money, but I'm at least doing, doing something I love. Yeah, I already knew how to make money, real estate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there again, that is the way. yeah, we're in America. Like if you can get real estate, get real estate or, or whatever. There's a lot of ways to make money. Um, and if, if that's your pursuit, then you will find something better than making stuff in any way, shape or form. And if you, if, you know, but if you're, if you're really, um, driven to pursue it, that's the key mm -hmm. because it will not be handed to you. Right. Yeah. Um, do you have some advice for brand new, for new graduates of North Bennett street school? You have sort of, you said something earlier expect your first year to be a wash yeah um anything further along those lines um spend time looking and not just at furniture like learn how to use a museum you know and not just to study furniture for like measurements but go to a museum and you know i always think that's a skill that we don't talk about which is like when i go to a museum i'm like okay today i'm talking texture and I can go from one room to the other just looking at texture. But if you go to the museum thinking like, I'm going to look and I have to take in every piece I see, that's like going to the grocery store and having to eat your way through the entire place, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. considering each product. No, you go, you have something in mind and you explore it, you know, because there's so much in making work 
and, and so many things have already been made. Why not go learn from them, but learn how to learn from them. And it's not just like appreciating that you could copy it or there's, there's elements to it, like study the comparatives. Wow. So when you look at texture and in, in, you know, an Egyptian textile, you know, and then you look at in texture at a Japanese bell, mm -hmm. you know, and you look at how the artisans did from one to the other and how they're interacting with it in form and technique. I think there's a lot to be learned there. So you could do that with color or form or scale or proportion, you know, and um, looking is huge. And it's just like an arts education. I think it's funny because for years I was like, what did I just do? But it's pretty valuable to be yeah. able to see those things. It's just also mind opening around um, just, just specifically, it opens your mind yeah. to expose yourself to the diversity of makes of everything, mm -hmm. you know. In a museum is a great spot because you're going to see things from all over the world. Yeah, it's 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 a way that we. It's the same way as reading a book. You can talk to you know hear somebody's thoughts from thousands of years ago. Yeah. In, in a museum, there's everybody's there. Um, quick question from a guest. Um, could you talk a, talk briefly about sales? You kind of did a little bit, but let's further that. I know a lot of furniture makers who make beautiful work but have trouble selling. What do you have to say about that? Um. Uh, I don't really know. See, one problem I have is that I've lost context of everybody else because I've been at it too long. So I'm, everything I do now is too specific. You know, like mm -hmm. I wrote a book a few years back. How that affected my sales, I can't say, but it has. So I feel like I get less and less appropriate a person to ask this of yeah. at some point. But I, um, I think a lot of it comes back to connecting to what people really value and what really captures them. And there's so many different markets. Like there could be designers who are buying for the very wealthy. I think it's it's a poor choice to try and sell things to wealthy people. There's not that many of them. A lot of people competing for their dollars and they're picky as can be. Mm -hmm. So what is it that you can sell? Like I, I had in my early years, like the, the town library clerk paying me out of every paycheck for a chair. And then at the end of the year, she got her chair. Like the work I was making was valued by people across this wider spectrum, I guess. Is one of the mm -hmm. things. If you want to do high-end work, well, there's an old uh, adage, um, what is like sell, um, sell to the masses and you'll dine with the classes and sell to the classes and you'll dine with the masses. Like if you sell just to, to wealthy people and that's what your goal is, you're, you're going to struggle and you're going to, you're not going to get wealthy yourself. That's not your road to wealth. Mm -hmm. You know, people get wealthy, how? By selling one thing to everybody. You know what I mean? And it can be cheap, but because they sold one to right, everybody. Right, right, right. And I'm yeah, not saying to yeah. dumb it down to the point where you're doing mass production. But if your goal is to do a niche market, how, that's just the narrowest of markets. Mm -hmm. You know, how are you going to make that work? People are going to go, wait a second, what? And I remember when I started, my grandfather was like, who would pay $1,000 for a chair? You know, and he was right. And that was an important lesson to me. You know, of course, I sell them for more than that now. <laughs> but um, at the same time, that's a really sets the problem well, which is this man. And frankly, he he did have enough money to buy a thousand dollar chair if he wanted, mm -hmm. but um, he wasn't going to, and he didn't see the value. And it's it's a way of relating to people and their money. You can't just think that, like rich. I found that the wealthy people often hold their money tighter than anybody. Where I found the people who were buying my chairs after a few years of doing it were people who were probably around my age now, like in their fifties. They had made enough money to be comfortable and wanted nice things that would last. Yep. What they, an heirloom. What it wasn't mean? vanity. It wasn't extreme fashion or trend. Mm -hmm. It was, they just wanted something nice that would last. Yes. And so they connected with me and I tried to deliver that. And it was that sort of like, and they knew that it wasn't bells and whistles. It was just me working hard to get them that crap. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, you know, we're in a consumer culture and you got to read the room. A bit. Yeah, definitely have to read the room. Um, and also I'll just back up something else Pete said earlier is just engage with the buyer, you know, whether it's trade show or one-on-one, -on -one, or if you have a little shop, it's about engaging and having a story there. I mean, that's. And if you can't find someone who can, mm -hmm. and in some ways, one of the reasons that Karen and I've talked is like, I can't talk about my own work that well anymore. Um, it's just gotten beyond me a little bit. And I need someone, for instance, like Karen, to represent me. Yeah. So I'm going to go and say, here's what he's doing. He, you're not going to talk to him about it because he's going to you know, get tongue tied and embarrassed, you know, or this, you know, and be, you know, your connection, to your work can be very personal, especially mm -hmm. the more personal the work is, which is my goal. Um, so if you can't do it, find someone who can. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 
Um, and we're we're at the top of our hour. Can we invite Colin Schmidt over here for a pop in? And our other North Bennett grads that have come through these halls, I'm just want to giving give, give them some love too. Um, Claire Minahan's beautiful Travisher. And we have some other tools here, but who are these from? This is Kelly Harris. This is Kelly's tool. And a tool that's gone through Aspen Golan's um, collaboration. collaboration uh, was it Chairmaker's Toolbox? That's yes. So this represents the North Bennett Street, well, a slice of the North Bennett Street faction of Pete Galbert's chairmaking workshop. And um, we all know Colin, he was one of our first in the making guests. And I just have one last question for you before we say goodbye to everybody. You said the Windsor chair was one of the most infuriating things for you. That's right. Point to what part of it was the most infuriating thing for you? The spindles. There we go. Spindles. But now he's working here in this shop. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Uh, there's, there's so much more complexity to making something square round. Yep. Uh, it, it seems in principle such a simple thing to do but there are steps to take <laughs> there are steps to take there are processes to follow and uh it it's a tricky task but yeah. you're 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 doing it you're you're doing I'm it i'm doing it <laughs> all right well that is our program thank you pete thank you so much for letting us crash your shop my pleasure and thanks to um to georgia I don't know if anybody got to see her. And thanks to our guests for being here. And we'll see you next week for part two of the employer spotlight. And thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. All right. Take care.